Everybody here in alert? I started last week talking about the, the clarification of seasons, where you are, where you believe you're called to be, the things that you feel are in the way of you getting there. And God gave me another re revelation about it this week. The things that you believe that are in the way and the things that actually are in the way. Yeah. And the revelation began to become clear to me that a lot of times, are you listening? Are you listening? Yes. Say, I'm listening. A lot of times the things that we think are in the way are the things that the enemy uses to distract us from seeing what is really in the way. So he'll get us caught up in trying to move something that does not need to be moved. And embracing the thing that should be moved. It's a deflection. So... I believe that this is a house of accountable people. We want to do right. We're not trying to find a way to get over on the Lord. You know, I've been in churches where, you, you know, people, you know, spiritual lawyers, they, yeah, but the Bible don't actually say. <laughs> but, but, okay, I understand fornication, but what is marriage really? <laughs> no, but listen, I, I know I'm not the only one who's heard it. You have these people that they're, they're, they're literally trying to find a way to get away with it. I believe we're a house of people who want to walk with God and we want to do it right. So with that said, when I begin to like go over my heart what he's been showing me, and I need you... To understand, as I lay this foundation, you know, I always start by laying a foundation. I want you to understand something. What I'm teaching, sharing, preaching, whatever you want to call it, is what I'm walking through in this season, which I always do. You always get the inside track with me, and you'll get to walk through it with me, and you'll get to watch me navigate through it. And if I fall and bump my head, you'll get to see me do it and hopefully not do it. <laughs> Unfortunately, like sheep sometimes, people just want to follow you right off the cliff. And yeah, I got to bump my head, too, <laughs> and learn my own way. You can, but you don't have to. There is a realm that is overlooked by us. Because everything in the world and around us is designed to make us focus on our senses. How I feel about something, how, how this makes me feel, what I like, what I don't like, what makes me happy, what makes me unhappy, you know, the things I desire, the things I don't desire. You can't talk to me that way. All, all of these things clamor for your attention to the point that the realm of the spirit is unheard. You got it? Those things are designed to distract you from seeing what you're supposed to see. So when I introduce the hindrances that we believe to be versus the hindrances that really are, this gives you a different light. You got it? So if the enemy's job would be to bombard our senses to the place that we don't sense the move of the spirit, he's won without having to attack. Let me give you an example. So... 
Jesus asks a question. This is one example. Who do men say that I am? And the men immediately begin to answer from the perspective of stimuli. Emotional and logical understanding. Educational understanding. Some say Elijah. Some say Moses. You know, based on what we see and the things you do, you clearly some kind of prophet, no question. In our minds. Okay. Who do you say that I am? Now, stay with me. Why didn't he just go straight to who do you say that I am? See, this, see, this, this, yeah, that's the one that matters. Why didn't he just ask that? Why did he go with who do men say that I am first? Think about that a minute. Because the, what they say shouldn't matter. Only what you say should matter. He wanted to know who do men say that I am because he wanted to know what you've been hearing. Because he knows based on what you've been hearing, you've drawn a conclusion based on what you've heard somebody else say. Hmm. So people come to me in a situation and I have to start to ask, what have men said to you about God? Well, he, can't put, he won't put more on you than he can bear. And what do you say about God? Well, he won't put more on you than you can bear. Okay, they said that. That's not scriptural. And now you're saying it as a point of faith, and you're anchoring yourself into some stimuli that makes some religious sense to you, that gives you the ability to allow the enemy to continue to whip on you and just accept it. No? No? So based on that, since God won't put more on me than I can bear, then that means whatever's on me, I should be bearing. So I'm not supposed to rebuke the devil at any point and take authority because I'm supposed to bear this. Because God won't put... See, see, you, you see, when you start to walk backwards through the stuff, you start to realize that the devil is working through the church and ministries to feed you with doctrines that make you subject to him. Everything designed to keep you. So you think the devil's holding you back when the reality is you are taking on a religious belief that's holding you back. The devil doesn't have the authority to do so. If you don't exercise the authority, the devil doesn't have to bow. If you don't rebuke the devil, he doesn't have to go. But the Lord knows. But yet the Lord does know. Hold up. Not only does he know, he gave you to, uh, the authority to deal with it. And if you don't use that authority, you can't say, the Lord knows what I can handle. Now, who do men say that I am? Some say a prophet, some say they, So they literally, if you listen to what I'm saying, they were relegating and, and, and kind of positioning Jesus. Are you listening to me? You sure? In what realm? In the flesh realm? That's the question. What realm were they putting Jesus in? In the natural realm, flesh, natural, same. Something else, come on. I'm looking for something. What realm were they putting Jesus in? He said, who do men say that I am? He said, a prophet. Um, some say Elijah. What were they doing? No? No takers? He's an intellectual world, humanizing him. This is good. We're getting, come on. You, you, you give? 
in the realm of that, of that which they could already understand. They had never had God walk with them. Okay. They had never had God walk with them. Adam did. Mm. <laughs> After Adam fell, the prophets came and walked with men. So they didn't have God walk and talk with them. So they could not accept Jesus as God in the flesh because they did not understand that concept. So what they tried to do is put them in the realm of you must be a human being with prophetic abilities, but they could not see the God power. They immediately tried to put them in the class of a, a human prophet. So something happens. He switches the question. Who do you say I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Come to free us. And he says, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. What you just spoke was from a realm that went beyond the who do men say that I am because you are in the understanding of who men say that I am, but you just spoke something by the Spirit, and you don't even know what you just said. And I'm going to tell you how I can back that up, because if you read that whole story, three verses later, Jesus said, and I shall, you're right, and you are Peter, and on this foundation I will build my church. And I will be turned over to men, and I shall be put to death. And Peter said, I rebuke you. Come out of him, you devil. You should not die. And all of a sudden, within speaking from the rhema of spirit, he was right back in the realm of flesh and trying to control things that he saw to be obstacles from his point of view. Just like that. Jesus one minute, spirit one minute, flesh two seconds later. Just like that. And the same Jesus that said, flesh and blood and real. And you're Peter, you're Peter. And on the found, this foundation, I will build my church. And he had to turn to him two seconds later and say, get thee behind me, Satan, to the same person. So as fast as his ego went to the roof, he looked at them. Mm, see, 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 flesh and blood. Didn't reveal that. You heard that? And far, we're going to build the church, Peter. Hmm. And two seconds later, he had to say, get thee behind me, Satan, for you're not about the things of God. Now we get a serious revelation. Because the hindrance was created in his concept, and when he moved in the realm of the spirit, he didn't know how to stay there. He immediately diverted back to the realm of the flesh. Hello. So we have these moments these moments of tingle and great revelation and woo, and you'll call me and you'll say, you know, and God showed me some things. Whoo. And five seconds into the conversation, you showing me what God showed you, you right back into pulling into the realm of the flesh and reasoning into limits. Hmm. And I'm like, the spirit has totally left this conversation, but they're still going. They're still explaining. They pulled it right back to, no, this shall not happen. I rebuke that. That's what Peter did. You shall not die. You just said you are the Christ. Well, if you understood what the Christ was, you would understand that Christ would come to die. But you didn't understand that because the revelation came through you and you didn't even have control or understanding of what was being spoke through you. So people say to me, I believe in Jesus' name, I'm healed. I don't receive that. But you know the doctor said it. But I believe the Lord, you know, as long as God will line up with Dr. Swartz, it's going to be okay. I'm not picking on you. You know I'm not, because I'm not perfect. I'm walking through these things myself. But I'm coming to the realization that when these ramas hit me, how do I move forward and keep those ramas with me? 
How do I not hear them in church or hear them prophesy or hear where it spoke or see something and get excited and then when I go forward, take it with me and not leave it in that moment? Am I speaking to somebody today? Do I have the answers? No, I'm seeking them out. But I'm aware that it exists, which gives me the advantage. You're now aware that it exists, and it gives you the advantage. You're now aware that there's a presence that you feel when the word of God is spoken to you, over you, about you, or, or directly to you, that you receive. And then it is my job and your job by the Holy Spirit to manage that anointing and keep it with us and not begin to de- dilute it with our opinions. Hmm. So God began to say to me, the obstacles that you focus on are limited in power because they're earthly. I'm not as educated. I never finished this school. I, you know, I know there's some sin in my life. You know, if I could just, you know, get that right, you know, God would, you know, help me, you know. He don't bless no mess, you know. And I'm like, if he didn't bless a mess, everybody's going to hell. He died for your mess. The biggest mess you could possibly have. You were aliens from God without Christ. Hmm. Let me bring this point home with this, and then I'll go forward. We'll go back to the words in the scripture. Christ came in the flesh to relate to your mess. He came to understand the struggle of your mess. Your mess is not the issue. Your unwillingness to see his deliverance from your mess is the issue. Your inability to grasp the fact that God is not focused on your mess like you are. Scripturally speaking, forgetting those things which are behind, you press forward to the mark of the high calling. I said, stood before you about a month ago and said, stop trying to build from your weaknesses and allow God to build you from the points of your strengths. And right away, people start coming back to me, you know, here's where I feel I'm strong, here's where I feel I'm strong. I started asking people to explain it to me. And we had a vision builders meeting. I said, explain your strengths. And at the end of the meeting, I said, everybody explained their natural strengths. Nobody locked on to the spiritual strength. So when I talk to you, for example, and you start telling me, well, God is showing me this, and I need to work on this, and he's showing me I need to not do this, and I've got to be better at this. and I got, You're still focusing from your weaknesses, aren't you? You're still telling me what you feel you lack, aren't you? You're still telling me what you need to get better, and instead of giving me the provision that you have to be better, and then just focus on that provision. You're going to stack your life against mine or somebody else's, and I'll, my, I'll walk and assume that your closeness to God is dependent on you lining more up with the way I walk and being more like me or some other human being, and for that reason, God will bless you when your whole foundation is on I must decrease, he must increase. The more myself I lose, the more he takes over. The more I can hear his voice and obey his voice, it doesn't matter what my flesh says. It doesn't say things. It doesn't think where it wants to. I'm busy doing the work. Are you listening to me? And that lines me up with truth. The best way to walk right, right is to do it. Not talk about it, pray about it, scheme about it, you know, you know, spiritualize it. Just do it. Get about the business of the Lord. And that's why he said to Peter, get me behind me, Satan, for you care not about the things of God but of man. No, you didn't hear it. When he turned to Peter right after him, he's saying, and you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build the church. He wasn't talking about Peter himself. He was talking about that revelation. You are the Christ. And then he had to turn around two seconds later and say, get thee behind me, Satan, for you care not for the things of God, but the things of man. Same conversation. 
There's not even a chapter break in that. It goes straight through. The things of man, I would, I would equate to the approval, opinion, or points of view of men. You don't care about the things of God. You care about the things of man. You need man's approval. So I'm going to throw a question out. Do you need man's approval to be a Christian? But do you? You, you, you know the right answer. But do you? But do you? Has somebody defined for you outside of the word and your relationship with God what a good Christian is supposed to be and you're trying to live up to that? Are you trying to impress me as pastor? By coming to me and say spiritual things to me to make me think that you're really spiritual? Then you care not for the things of God, but the things of men. So I have meetings with people all the time, and I ask questions. And I ask probing questions because this is where God has me. And I'll say, what made you think that? Why did you do that? What made you say that? And I, without question, get these kind of answers. Well, I know I'm outside of the will of the Lord, and I know my flesh, you know, it dominates, and, and um, I need to surrender my flesh to the Lord. And I'm like, I didn't ask you any of that. I don't even care. I don't want to hear that. That's garbage. I don't want to hear that. You're saying the right thing you think you're supposed to say to make me go, hallelujah, amen. Praise the Lord. You're on your way to hell, <laughs> right? No, that's not the question. The question is, do you even identify with the voice that speaks to you? Who do you say that I am that makes you feel that you need to try to behave a certain way or see things a certain way and not even want to allow God to show the house to the house and show you who you are so you can make the correction? Every day of my life, I want God to show me to me, not the me that I like about me, not the me I've accepted about me, not the religious me that I think God should approve of, but show me who I really am. Show me, the, show me that nice me, I like the compliments, but show me a little ugly me that still kind of hide over there, that po pokes his head out on Groundhog's Day just to make itself known. Show me the me that, show me the who that I say you are that I don't acknowledge that I say you are. And that's why he asks questions. That's why Jesus said when he brought his son to him to be delivered, Jesus said, do you believe I'm able to do this? Jesus walked up to the man in the pool of Bethesda. He could have just healed him. He asked him questions and gave a man the chance to tell what he really believed. I've been laying here for decades. And when the water is troubled, I have no man to put me in. He broke his whole theory down of why he was in his situation. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Sitting every day at the place that people go to get healed. So he had faith that healing happened there. Strong faith that healing happened there. But not faith to believe that it would happen to him. So he showed up there, giving into every offering, showing up every meeting. Every time a new delivering pastor comes to visit the church, they are all there. They're always in the place but never receiving. So now he said, there's no man. And he said, take up your bed and walk. He didn't say, well, let me put you in that water. Jesus didn't even say, well, let me go sprinkle some on you. He said, get up from there. 
Hmm. Hmm. Now, let me say it again. Jesus' response to him was, get up from there. He didn't even say, get up, take up your bed, and go get in the water. Now, you're, you're not catching this? Jesus said the water was irrelevant. Well, this is the pool that they put you in and people get healed. The water is irrelevant. The methods in which it normally works doesn't count if you're with me. There's a realm that operates outside of your normal. There's a realm that operates outside of your familiar. There's a realm that's bigger than the power that you've already tapped into. I'm just laying at the feet of Jesus. And here you still laying. And Jesus is saying, get up from there. Get out of that position. There's nothing hindering you in the natural. What's hindering you is your belief and your understanding of what I'm doing in your life. Get up from there. Get out of that position. Take your bed up and leave. Don't come lay in front of this pool anymore. Get up. You think that man came back to the pool the next day? I don't think so. He didn't need it. But for however many years he laid there, and he said he laid there for a long time, for a long time, so what was really presenting him? The devil? Evil spirits? What was stopping him from receiving God's promise for his life? What was stopping him? Okay. Better question. What's stopping you? What's stopping you? What, what are you laying in front of the pool waiting for? And how long have you been laying there? Man, I got so many notes and stuff I want to go over, but I can't. I'm not released to do it. So I, I'll just keep that. That's a real question. And I want you to ask yourself that question right now. <laughs> what obstacles have you decided? You're listening to me? Are you listening to me? Yes. What obstacles have you decided are keeping you from the promise of God? You don't have to answer me. I want you to think about it a minute. Because we all have them. If I went to each person in this room and told you to give me a breakdown of what your holdup is and why you think God hasn't moved on your behalf, I guarantee you, just by showing me your hands, how many of you feel like you have some kind of logical answer that you've come up with? Let me see. See, most people, we, we have a belief. I'm challenging you now to put that belief up against truth. I was talking to Jericho the other night, and... I made a statement about God's provision and the things that God has done in my life. And she made the statement, wow, you have a lot of faith. And that was a complimentary statement, but it hit me wrong because I immediately understood that she was concluding that I had a great quantity of something, a vast portion of something that made my ability to receive special and different from other people's. You have faith. Wow, man, I wish I had faith like that. I wish I had that kind of faith. I can tell that's what she was saying. And I said to her, that's a misnomer. 
I have a confidence in areas with my father that I've walked on long enough to develop a sense of security and maturity in that I don't question it. But there are other areas that I don't feel as confident about, and I feel like it's a struggle for me to stand and believe on those things. In other words, in the area of provision, I've walked with God long enough, and I've spent enough quality time with him that I don't need, or nor does it require faith, it, as the church folk use it, for me to accept it. I just know it to be a fact. I just know it's a fact. Everybody in this room has a place with God that you know is a fact, no question about it. You, how many of you born again? How many of you have to use your faith every day to believe you're born again? You know you are. There's no question for you. Some of you may say, yeah, well, I still have to struggle with it. But those of you who have walked with God long enough and know his love for you in that area, there's no question in your mind that you're saved. So you're not sitting home using your faith, quote-unquote, to be saved. So the areas that you are challenged, I don't know if you want to hear this, are the areas that you have not allowed God to mature. That's it. Nothing deep and spiritual, those areas you sit with. How many of you speak two languages? Okay. Why do you speak two languages? And do you speak one language stronger than the other? <laughs> you know where I'm going, right? I can't speak two languages. I speak one and smidges of other ones. And that's only because I haven't sat with them. I don't practice them. I don't use them daily. They're not part of who I am regularly. So uh, for me to try to even talk Spanish with people, I know a lot of Spanish words, but I have to stop and say, okay, wait a minute, is it el or la? Okay, it's female. I have to do this whole mental process before I speak because I am not familiar with that language. That's why when you ask somebody in a situation to pray, they go, uh, Father God, and I'm Father, um, and if it's, in, you know, if it's in your will, uh, right, you don't have the language of provision, so you don't know how to speak it comfortably. You don't practice it enough. You don't have enough conversation or dialogue with God that is a, verse, a first language to you. So you have to try to figure out which words go with which and which scripture should I put up. Jeremiah, is it 33? No, is it 333? Um, hold on, let me get my Bible. Let me get my translator. Let me put up my Google translator to make sure I'm saying it right. Because it's not real to you. You haven't sat with it long enough and had the dialogue long enough and the communication long enough. So somebody made a comment the other day about being broke, and I said, I don't speak broke. I don't speak broke. I don't, even, I don't, I don't know what's, what's broke. It's been two decades. I've never lacked a thing in my life. I don't know, always had a surplus. I don't know what broke is. I don't speak that language. I wasn't trying to be funny. I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck. I was telling him, that's a foreign word to me. I know who my father is. And one of the things I know is he's not broke. One of the things I know is he's not trying to figure out how to meet my needs. Ever. So if I'm ever figuring it out, is I've left him somewhere and I decided to go figure. Are we liking this conversation? So I've learned the things I struggle with is the things I struggle with. You didn't catch that. <laughs> yeah, the things I struggle with is the things I struggle with.
I've decided without knowing it who somebody says he is. Somebody told me when it comes to this, he doesn't deliver. Or he might not deliver. Or it takes time, it's a struggle. Or you got to go through it, you know, you got to go through the fire. You know, it's always darkest before the dawn and all these so- things that make great song lyrics but have nothing to do with a relationship with a father who loves you, who's provided for you, or things that pertain to life and godliness before you were even in your mother's womb. God is not deadbeat. And he doesn't have to check his budget to heal you, to bless you, to speak to you, to guide you, to instruct you. So we have moments. We have spiritual revelation moments that Peter had. For thou art a Christ. I'll speak a word over you, lay hands, and you get excited and jump around. and hey, thank, you, Jesus. thank you, Jesus. And then you leave it. And you go back without ever investigating who do you say he is. Pastor just said it. The prophet just said it. I got really excited about what he said, but I've never allowed God to show me who I say he is. It doesn't make a difference who I say he is. The next question comes down to, but who do you say that I am? And that's where the church finds itself stuck. It's not the devil. It's not the things you need to go through to learn. It's who do you say he is? Who do you say he is? What's your nickname for him? What do you know about him in that area of your life? What do you know? Not what have you heard. What do you know? Whatever it is. Fear, worry, depression. I don't care what it is. What do you say about him in that area? Who do you say? Well, I heard that Jesus is a healer, but who do you say that he is? I want you to begin to ask the question, starting today, God, who do I say you are? What do I really believe about you? Who do I say you are? And when God begins to show you who you say you are, he is, sometimes you realize what you're saying is not right. Sometimes you'll be embarrassed about what you realize you're saying. No need. Just repent. It will move the embarrassment, and you can go forward. But you're going to have to come to terms that there are things that you say about him that have framed your life and put you in a position that you're in today. I'm done. We're going to pray. Father, we, 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 we ask for your help. And we receive it. Your word said, if any of us lack wisdom, let it Ask, let us ask you and you give it to us liberally and you are brave of not and it will be given to us. But so we must ask you in faith, nothing wavering. So, Father, we come to you and we say, God, show us. Who do we say you are? Do we really love you? You asked Peter three times, do you love me? And every time he affirmatively, affirmatively said yes. And then you gave him a charge, feed my sheep. God, do we love you like you think we do? Have we decided the the level of love that we give you is good enough for you and you need to just take it? Do we really love you? Who do we really say that you are? Are you really Alpha and Omega or is it just a song we sing? Are you really the beginning and the end of our lives? Or when we sing that song, we're just saying of the world and of the spiritual realm, but not in our world. Who do we really say you are? Hmm. Who do we really say that you are? We surrender our hearts 
our thoughts, our minds, our opinions, our attitudes. And we trust that as you begin to unravel this week and avail to each person who they really are, when you begin to expose us and show the house to the house, that we'll be humble about it. We'll be graceful about it. We'll receive it with ease. We'll trust the truthful and integrity of your spirit and we'll be conformed into your very image and we will see breakthrough immediately. We believe that just like as Peter began to sink, he said, Lord, help me, I'm perishing. Immediately you stretched forth and took his hand. We believe that the moment we cry out for your assistance, immediately you take our hand. Father, every opinion of who we think you are that's been given to us, that we form from things we heard and things people have said, we surrender every aspect up to you. Take from us everything that doesn't line up. Lord, we are not designed to be easily offended. We are designed to grow in grace and wisdom. And we thank you for the victory that you've called us to have. And we make a decision today that you have full permission to change our view, to change our inner image and our outer image, we surrender to you, and we won't fight with you as you change it. We'll do our best not to, at least. And if we do, just poke us and let us know. We are greater than what we've allowed you to let us be. And we choose today to live in the fullness of that. Bless you. And thank you for blessing us. In the name of our Savior. Christ Jesus, we believe and we receive. Amen.